Okay, so I'm Ken Pataki. I live in Jamestown, North Carolina, and I recently joined the Baden-Powell Service Association, or BPSA, as a lone rover scout, since there are very few other scouts um, in BPSA that live in my area. Um, my scoutmaster and rover scouting leader is Susan Pesnecker. And this is a taped version of my requirements for Tenderfoot, as well as my application for the Squire Award. So today I'm going to go through the requirements of Tenderfoot, and then I'm going to submit this tape for review by BPSA. So I'd like to start out just by um, mentioning a few key points about the uniform for BPSA. Uh, you can probably see that I'm wearing a greenish colored shirt. This is actually a light forest green, which is the preferred color for rover shirts. Olive is another option. This is a red necker, uh, which is the standard color for Lone Scouts. And there are different colors for different groups. Um, this necker actually was my very first necker as a Boy Scout in the 1970s. Uh, just coincidentally happens to be red. So this necker right here is about 40 something years old. Um, and um, a couple of patches. This is the patch for the BPSA uh, organization, uh, which is worn over the right breast pocket. And this is the World Federation of International Scouting to which BPSA belongs, and this patch is worn over the right pocket, or optionally for women, above the right pocket. Um, the Tenderfoot Award, when it is earned, would be worn here on the left pocket, or optionally for women, above the left pocket. And then the Squire Award, once earned, will be pinned. It's a ribbon that's pinned to the left shoulder and hangs down the arm. Also, on the right arm is the uh, location and group of the scouting group that you belong to. In my case, it's the first Lone Scouts BPSA. Uh, once you attend the Brown Sea Training Course, the BTC, that BTC patch goes right under there. Um, and there are other patches as you attain knighthood in the Rover program that mostly go on shoulder epaulets or shoulder bars that fit on these epaulets, which is why epaulets are required on the rover uniform. Rovers are the only ones that wear the bars on epaulets, so that's why these are required. So when I achieve knighthood status and start to earn some of those awards, they will go up here and up here. Uh, long sleeve shirts are preferred. However, um, short sleeve shirts are acceptable in the summertime. Um, long pants as well are preferred, though shorts are allowed in the summertime as well. Neutral, natural colors. Um, matching belt. I have an optional uh, folding pocket knife here. My old uh, buck hunter knife, again from 1979 or 80. It was a gift from my dad at Christmas time. And what else? Oh yeah, lest I forget the hat that's sitting on my head. This is actually called a campaign hat. And there are two hats that are approved for use in BPSA. One is the campaign hat and another is the beret. The beret can be either green or red. Um, the campaign hat is typically brown or olive. This campaign hat again has sentimental value. It was given to me at the completion of uh, Youth Leader Brown C Double Two training in the early 1980s when I rose to be a leader of my scout troop. And so I was awarded this hat and I've kept it for the past uh, almost 30 years. And it's definitely, uh, I'd say 35 years actually, it's definitely got sentimental value. Um, I thought of disposing it several times and it's interesting because then when I joined PPSA and I saw that they wore those, I was like, wow, let me see if I can drag that thing out of the attic. I did have to steam it and iron the brim, um, but it's still serviceable. 
another item that's an optional part, or in some cases an included part of the BPSA uniform is the staff. Staffs are generally about five feet in length. They can be made of a simple dowel, or they can be made of a natural stick um, that is found in the woods. This was found in the woods by me several years ago, and I have dressed it up to become a staff. I like the, uh, the dramatic uh, end to the staff, which I have decorated with various metal badges that I've uh, earned or programs I participate in in scouting. This is an Eagle Scout ring uh, because I was a, a BSA Eagle Scout. Uh, this is paracording that's wrapped around the handle for a more comfortable grip, more stable grip, but also can be unwrapped in the case of an emergency and used as a rescue cord. And there's a rubber stopper that I got from the hardware store for the bottom uh, to protect it from fraying. And then I use linseed oil, which is a boiled flaxseed oil, to apply several coatings to the wood to make it a little bit more shiny and protect it from uh, weathering and from water damage over time. Um, I'll talk a little bit more as I go through the requirements about the use of the staff in scouting because it's not just a decorative item. And I think I've covered everything that I can right now about the uniform. I will say, oh, I have some boots on. You can't see them. They're brown hiking boots um, to complete the uniform. And I'm standing in front of a unique flag, which is actually the flag of St. George. St. George was named by Baden Powell, the founder of Modern Scouting, as the patron saint of scouting. He was also the patron saint of uh, England and several other countries. Um, and he has an interesting history. If you read about St. George, he wasn't actually British. He came from somewhere in the Middle East, um, possibly, uh, possibly the Iraq area, possibly the Turkey area. And he's actually the patron saint of several countries that are not traditionally Christian. So he's sort of an interfaith kind of a saint in a way. Um, and... Anyway, his flag is traditionally used as the backdrop for rover night ceremonies, um, and I hope to use it uh, during my ceremony in the next several months when I earn that award. Okay, so the first requirement for Tenderfoot is know the Scout Law, promise, and motto, and understand their meanings. By the way, I'm getting these requirements out of the BPSA Rover Handbook, which can be purchased from the Quartermaster or downloaded online from the BPSA website. Know the Scout Law, Promise, and Motto and understand their meaning. So first, the Scout Law. Officially as stated, the Scout Law is roughly a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, and clean. A little bit of history on the Scout Law. Originally, there were only nine points, the first nine that I stated, the first nine that I stated, yeah. And then the tenth one, clean, was added a year or two later by Baden-Powell uh, after reviewing the, uh, the scout laws of other organizations. Interestingly, the Boy Scouts of America, or BSA, later added the 11th and 12th points, which actually show up as the 10th and 12th points, which happen to be brave and reverent. And I wonder about the historical significance of the fact that Baden-Powell did not embrace those two points of the law whereas the BSA did. And I think it could be because BSA has always had a close relationship with the military and with religious organizations, which it pretty much uh, mandates participation in religion. Um, it does a lot of, uh, uh, accepts a lot of recruiting from the military. So I wonder if the brave and the reverent had to do with that, and I wonder if Baden-Powell was trying not to have boys 
recruited for uh, the military or forced into religious groups, so he kept those out. Not really sure, but that's my suspicion. Um, on to the scout oath. So the oath, as is stated by BPSA and originally by Baden Powell, on my honor, I promised to do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to help other people at all times, and to obey the Scout Law. A little bit of history there, when Boy Scouts of America took on that oath, they changed it to where uh, to obey the Scout Law came before to help other people at all times, and they added the last three phrases to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. So that's a difference now between the Boy Scouts of America and the Baton Powell Service Organization, which emulates the original intent of Baton Powell. And the motto for both organizations remains, be prepared. So Scouts are known to be prepared. That's why we carry knives on our belt. Sometimes we carry rope with us. Whenever we go on outings, we know where we're going. We're familiar with maps and orientation. And we're also very helpful and engaged with people who need help. So a scout takes initiative to help because a scout is prepared. I remember back in the 70s uh, when I was just joining scouting, there were actually commercials on national TV that had a theme, be prepared. Be prepared, are you ready to take the lead? Be prepared, are you ready to take the lead, lead, lead? And that was kind of actually, um, you know, a motivation for me to join scouting at that time. So I wish that um, uh, different scouting organizations would, you know, utilize the media to advertise their uh, programming and their benefit for young people like they used to do. All right. Moving on to the scout salute and a handshake and their importance. This would be requirement two for tenderfoot. So the scout handshake is made with the left hand rather than the right. And this signifies trust and faithfulness because the idea is that you have to put down your warrior shield that you normally carry with your left hand and your sword with your right so that you can actually shake hands with your uh, friend or compatriot. So all over the world in every scouting organization, um, scouts use the left hand to communicate friendship but also trust and faithfulness in each other. Um, the salute is made with three fingers of the hand with the thumb holding the nail of the pinky. And normally it's made with the right arm touching the edge of the brim of the hat or the edge of the eyes in the case of a beret. And this salute is made whenever the flag, the American flag, is raised or lowered. It's also made during the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, during the singing of the Star Spangled Banner and other uh, patriotic songs. And um, yeah, so it is made with the um, right hand normally, but in the case of the staff, when a scout is holding the staff, the salute would be made with the left hand, again, three fingers here in this manner. Now the scout sign, which you saw me use earlier when I was um, re repeating the scout oath and the scout law, that's made with the same gesture, holding the pinky with the thumb and the three fingers, but the sign is held out to the side, approximately equal to the eye level, with a perpendicular um, angle, right angle between the upper and lower arm, and again, typically used with the right hand. 
Now, not only is the scout sign used for the recitation of the scout law and the scout oath, however, uh, in addition, it's also used to signify silence. So when scout leaders want scouts to be quiet and pay attention, they simply raise the sign instead of yelling, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And it's a universally recognized sign of quiet, pay attention. Again, when the scout staff is also being used with the uniform in a formal ceremony, the staff would be held on the right side and the sign would be made with the left hand, like this. Um, one thing I did, I think I believe I misspoke on the issue of the salute with the staff. So rather than saluting uh, with the left hand to the brim of the hat or the side of the eye while holding the staff, actually the hand crosses over the front of the body and the three fingers of the sign touch the staff lightly in this manner. So that is the official salute with the staff. And one last thing I should say about the fingers of the scout sign or the scout salute, they stand for the three points of the scout oath, which are duty to God and country, helping others at all times, and obeying the scout law. So the third requirement for tenderfoot is be able to make and know the meaning of the wood tra woodcraft trail signs. Trail signs are signs that are left by scouts in the woods for other scouts. And they're made with a number of natural materials, either pebbles or rocks or sticks typically, sometimes grass that has been knotted together in a bundle and then bent. Um, so some very simple uh, trail signs that need to be known by scouts if they're in the woods and need to follow other scout signs. So basically you can make an arrow with three sticks that point in the direction of the trail you want the scouts following you to go. You make two sticks for the arrowhead and one for the shaft. You can also um, uh, take those sticks and make an arrow to the left or an arrow to the right to indicate that you want the, st the scouts to go left or right. Um, and you can also put the sticks in a cross fashion like this on the ground, which means stop or don't go down this trail or stop going in this direction. Normally stop would only be used to, it would either be used to have someone wait for you or actually to stop you from going direction and then you would see a different trail sign leading you in a different direction. Uh, stones can also be used to create arrow patterns. So arrow to the left with stones, arrow to the right, arrow straight ahead. Um, typically the shaft isn't needed, but just the, the stones can be made into an arrow uh, fashion. And then rather than an X pattern to indicate stopping, you would put the stones in a straight horizontal line. Um, that would indicate stopping. So you can also use rocks, uh, larger rocks. Again, you can have them straight across for stopping. You can have them in a line, horizontal line with extra rocks on one side, which indicates go that way or over there, go that way. And straight ahead would be rocks in a straight line with other rocks in front showing that you're going straight ahead. And again, you can bundle some grass together using some strands to tie the grass. And then you could bend the grass to the left or bend the grass to the right or just have the grass going straight ahead. Um, another couple of signs that you can make, uh, you can make a sign with a number that has a square around it and an arrow pointing to one direction. And the number would indicate how many paces from that location would be located something of importance, potentially some kind of message or some kind of item. And finally, an important item to note, even more so because it was actually placed on Baden-Powell's uh, tombstone, is a circle of stones with one stone in the middle. And that indicates, I'm home, or I've gone home, or the trail has ended. So those are, uh, that's my interpretation of the basic trail signs for scouting.
And I guess I'm going to go on to requirement number four, know the composition and history of and how to fly and fold the American flag. So there's a lot of history about the American flag. But essentially, the first American flag was created in 1776 by Betsy Ross. And it consisted of the same 13 red and white alternating stripes, which indicated or represented the 13 colonies. And then in the corner was a square of blue with 13 stars in a circle. Again, the 13 stars representing the 13 colonies. And the colors were significant as well. We've maintained the same basic three colors of the flag throughout our history as a country. The red stands for bravery and strength. The white stands for purity and innocence. And the blue stands for steadfastness or sticking to it as well as justice. There were many versions of the flag that were created over the next 200 and... Uh, well, almost 200 years. Um, as the nation kept growing and adding states, they kept adding stars and different configurations of the stars in the upper left-hand corner until the last version was created in 1959 with the addition of Hawaii as the 50th state. And now we have the pattern that we have today with all 50 states in rows in the left-hand corner, still on the blue background with the 13 alternating red and white stripes. Um, some important issues about the American flag. The American flag is supposed to be flown during the day. So typically it's supposed to be mm, raised in the morning and taken down in the evening at sunset. Um, there are exceptions made for all weather flags, but generally it's a, a matter of respect to take the flag down uh, at night as well as during bad weather. Uh, when the American flag is flown with other flags, it should be flown typically uh, between them and it should be pulled higher than the other flags uh, on the pole or the other pole should be shorter. Um, the American flag should also be flown on the right hand side of the stage, so left facing if the crowd is watching it. Um, also, the American flag is never supposed to touch the ground. That is a very important uh, fact that was taught to me as a young scout. Actually, I think I was scared by the, uh, the old, um, the old uh, street wisdom that if the, the flag touched the ground, you have to burn it, uh, and that scout would have to buy a new one. So that kind of encouraged us to uh, never let the flag touch the ground, but actually it's just a matter of disrespect. Uh, there's no need to burn the flag, but there, there should be effort taken to make sure the flag is uh, held by the people putting it up and taking it down without it touching the ground, including the folding process, which I'll talk about next. So for the folding of the American flag, it should always be done with two people. And each person would stand on the long end of the flag, holding it by the corners and folding it once in half and then once again in fourth, turning it so that the stars uh, are on top, facing up. And then the person that is on the stripes end, not the stars end, would begin folding, using one corner to fold across in a triangle pattern and then flip it horizontally over that line and then back diagonally and then back horizontally and back diagonally walking it in all the way to the end to where the final fold leaves a triangle of blue with stars on it maybe having to tuck the end in and that's how the flag is supposed to be carried and that's how the flag is supposed to be stored only in that manner and held either under the arm or close to the chest so it will not be dropped. And that is my understanding of the folding and the brief history of the American flag, as well as some important considerations when flying it. Oh, I'm sorry, there is something else. There are a couple of unconventional ways to fly the American flag. One way is to fly it upside down. And that's only done in dire emergencies to indicate SOS or need help immediately. Uh, or the situation around this flag is extremely dangerous, proceed with caution. Another unusual way to fly the flag is at half-mast. This is typically only done by uh, 
po political leaders such as the president of the united states or governors of states and it indicates the uh... the death and mourning of an important figure uh... typically political figure in in our nation so i hope i covered all the bases there uh... i know that's a summary especially of the history uh, but there's a lot of detail that can be gone into about every single flag and all of its histories. But I, I think I covered the basics. And that was number requirement number four. Um, so one last thing I'll talk about is number five requirement. No certain uses of the scout staff. There are a couple of uses that are mentioned here that I... I don't know or maybe obsolete now such as using the staff to hold back a crowd I don't think I would re recommend that any of our scouts do that or maybe beating out a bush or grass fire not really sure that I would recommend that one as well however you could use the scout staff to improvise one side of a stretcher um, where you would wrap cloth around the two staffs and then the person could lie in between them and you could carry them that way. You could also use the staff as one of three poles that could be tied together at the neck and made into a tripod from which you could hang a pot and cook a meal over an open fire. Another use of the staff is as a walking stick, which is not even mentioned in the manual. I'm kind of surprised. Um, and another one is to use it as the front pole for a tent. So you could tie a rope to it and tie the rope to the ground, throw the tarp over the rope, and then stake the tarp down in all the corners and use this as the major tent pole. Uh, you could use one of these or two of these, or you could even lash several of them together two together with one across the top, making a top ridge. You could have them going down to the corners in a triangle pattern as well. Um, you can also use your pole or your scout staff as a measuring stick. So it mentions in there that you could put markings, and I'll probably do that every foot with a permanent marker on your staff and then use it as some kind of a yardstick. And finally, you can use a staff to scale walls, though I have not tried that yet, and I'm kind of wondering how that would be possible. I may have to watch a YouTube video about how to do that. But I think it may be digging in the end into the ground and leaning it against the wall and then climbing up it and standing on the end while you then get up and over the wall. Okay. That was requirement Number five, knowing certain uses of the scout staff. So the final requirement for tenderfoot is tie the following knots, reef knot or square knot, sheet bend, clove hitch, bowline, round turn and two half hitches, sheep shank and understand their respective uses. And along with that, there is requirement number seven, know how to whip the end of a rope. I'm going to start with number seven because I'm going to use the ropes that I whip to then tie some of the knots and um, yeah, for, for requirement six. There are two primary ways to whip a rope. And one of them is called the common method and the other one is called the heat method. If you have a heat source, you can easily use heat if your rope or cord is made of nylon, which is a newer version, which many of the ropes are made from that. Now it's extremely strong and durable and um, again, it, it, it can be uh, heat whipped with a heat source. Um, however, the older style hemp ropes, you know, could not and whipping would have to be done with a small additional cord, which I'll demonstrate. So, I'm going to put my glasses on for this so I can make sure that I see this really well. I'm going to first demonstrate the, uh, the heat method, which is basically you're going to take a flame uh, one of these is recommended because you don't want the match to burn out in your hand while you're doing it, or a lighter. You could do it next to a fire that you've made as well, a cooking fire, uh, but just be careful about getting too close to the flames. 
And you just want to hold the heat source um, slightly under and a little bit away from. You don't want to put it directly on the actual rope. And then you want it to basically heat the end. And what you'll see is it'll slightly brown and the plastic, which is the nylon, will start to melt and it will start to congeal and the fibers will turn into kind of a solid at first wet end and then you want to wait a few moments because it's very sticky and very hot and you don't want to burn yourself by touching it on your skin. You can even blow on it if you'd like to accelerate the process and just to make sure you don't touch it onto any skin or really any other object until it's completely cool. This is a standard braided piece of nylon rope. Um, the second method of whipping is called the common method, or the common whip method, and that's where you use a much smaller piece of uh, cord, which this one in is also made with nylon, but you don't need a nylon one. And in this method, you actually take the small piece of cord running parallel with the larger rope and you want one end going down away from the end of the rope a couple of inches and then you're going to make a loop at the top and the loop can come slightly ab above the top of the rope or it can be aligned with the top of the rope but basically it's in that vicinity and you're going to hold all three of those pieces in your one hand could be in my case my left hand that would be the original piece the loop uh, piece and then the rope itself. You're going to take your other hand and begin to wrap your uh, the long end of the rope of the cord around the end of the rope several times. You want to do it at least five times but you could do it more if you want. I think I'm going to go a little bit further on this one. And then and you want to get the end of your wrapping fairly close to the end of the rope otherwise you won't really be whipping anything. Then you're going to hold this contraption you just made and feed the front end of your cord that you just wrapped through the loop that you just made one time through. And then you're going to go back to the other end of your cord, which should be still in parallel with the, um, with the rope. And you can actually feed that through the loop that's on the other end if you want to. That's optional. But essentially what you're going to do is you're going to pull down on that piece that runs in parallel with your, uh, with your rope. Let me tuck that bottom piece in here so I can make sure that I lock that one in as well. I'm going to tuck that bottom one in the loop. So I'm pulling down and that's going to pull that loop down in the top and bring the top of my whip down against the rope and lock in my whip on the top end. And then I can pull up on the bottom to lock in my bottom. And then essentially I have the rope is whipped. So that will keep, and then you want to trim those ends off. And personally I would use the heat method to, um, you know, well let's just do it. Well no, I don't have my scissors. Trim the, the cord off on both ends and then again use a little heat to make sure that this cord doesn't unravel and now this particular rope won't unravel because it's been whipped this way. Okay, so now that we have a piece of whipped rope, um, I also have a piece, a small piece of paracord here, another smaller nylon uh, cord that I also use to wrap my walking stick with. And we're going to use these two here to demonstrate the, uh, the knots that are required for tenderfoot. The first knot is the uh, reef knot, which is more popularly called the square knot. The square knot is normally designed to be used for rope of the same thickness and type. So, for example, with this particular rope, I could use the two ends to form a square knot by going over, left over right, and coming through, and then going right over left and coming through, and that will create a square knot. And it has a very distinct shape with one loop going in front and one loop going behind. Now, if you don't have the two ends available, such as maybe 
you have two pieces of rope you're trying to connect, then you want to take the first piece, let's imagine that the first piece is this loop, is this piece right, this end right here, and I made it into a loop, and I'm, I'm imagining this is separated, and I'm going to take the second piece with my other hand, I'm going to go through the front, I'm going to go, I'm sorry, I'm going to come up from the bottom here, I'm going to go around the back, and then I'm going to go back down through. And that's going to make the same square knot pattern that I had before. So up, around the back, up through, around the back, and back down. That'll make your square knot. Now, there are times when, and I'll just show you that with two different chords, because that can be done with two different chords. So again, you could do one of two methods. You could just left over right, pull it through, right over left, pull it through, and make your square knot. There it is. Or if one of the ends wasn't available, um, and you've got, you could make a loop here. Let's say you want to tie on to the side of a rope. You could make a loop with it. Then you can come up from the bottom. As I said before, go around the back and come back down through the middle and complete your square knot. However, there is a better knot to be used when two ropes are of a different size and thickness, and that's called the sheet bend. It's very similar to a square knot or reef knot, except for one difference. So the way you'd make this knot is you would come up from the bottom, again, out of the open hole, you're going to go around the back just like you did with a square knot, but instead of coming straight back down the hole, you're going to lift and go underneath the cord that you just wrapped around, like this, and you're not going to tuck it back in. And then you're going to pull these taut like this. And that is actually a more secure way of joining the two and will slip less than using the square knot. That's called the sheet bend. Just to make sure I cover these in the right order. So the next one is called a clove hitch. And a clove hitch is designed to uh, anchor a, a, a lashing onto a pole. In fact, I used clove hitches at both ends of my lashing here where I wrapped my staff. And I'm going to use the staff here to demonstrate the clove hitch. Um, the clove hitch is made by taking the rope and wrapping it once around. And on the second wrap, you want to cross over the first wrap. And as you're coming up, you're going to come up in between the two you just made and tuck it underneath going in the same direction and then pulling both ends tight. So you have a wrap with your feeder in direction going across and through the middle and then it's, it's tight so you can lash with it. And just to show you, when you pull on it, it should stay tight. And then you can do your lashing. The next one is called, well, since I have the staff here, I'm going to go ahead and jump and do the round turn and the two half hitches. So this is... Uh, a way to attach a rope to a, to a pole, for example, a mooring, if you're going to moor a boat. You want to go um, over once, over twice, so you have one wrap. Then you're going to tuck over the top and come up through here to make your first half hitch. Tighten that, and then come under again and through to make your seventh, second half hitch and pull the two to each other. And so what you've got is a double wrap around followed by a half hitch, two half hitches, I'm sorry. And that will secure a boat or other vehicle or even an animal if you're riding a horse and you wanna secure it to a pole so it doesn't run away. Uh, it's a very quick knot to make, it's a strong knot, and it will definitely secure 
to a post. Obviously, you wouldn't do that to a staff because the staff can be moved around. This is an anchored post that's in the ground or part of a building or a dock if you're docking a boat. Um, the bowline is an interesting knot. This is used primarily in rescue situations. That's what that that's where I was taught to use it. And you have to learn how to make it with only one end of the rope because normally um, if a rope is uh, being thrown to you as a rescue rope, obviously you're only going to get one end of it. So let's just get one end here and imagine that the other end was thrown to us. Excuse me. And so the end that's thrown to us, we want to take it and wrap it around our body under our armpits, across our chest. And you have the feeder rope and you have the working part of the rope. The feeder rope you can't control. Um, the only thing you can control about the feeder rope is you're going to make a loop in it to make your bowline. And it's very important when you make your loop that you make your loop by taking the feeder line and coming underneath the part that's closest to you. Uh, underneath or on top? Um, <laughs> yeah. Right? So you're going to make it underneath, which means that the part that you're holding in your left hand, you're going to wrap on top of that part. Then you're going to come up from the hole. Imagine like a rabbit or an animal coming up through the hole. You're going to go around the feeder rope and then you're going to go back down the hole and pull it tight so that the, uh, the bowline is here, you can see it. And now when the rope is pulled, it will only tighten. The bowline is not an adjustable knot like some other knots, like the, 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 to, uh, the three half um, top line hitch. So it's not meant to be adjusted, but it is meant, you want to make it big enough so you have a little bit of room and then of course, you can repel your way out or you know, or if your legs are you know, injured, they could just pull you out and it will lift you out by your armpits. You can also put this knot on someone else who is injured or unconscious to help lift them out of an area where they've fallen or become incapacitated using this important knot. And the last knot is called the sheep shank. The sheep shank is designed essentially to store rope, so or to make rope that you have shorter. I haven't used this knot very often in my life, but it's one of the requirements. So you take the rope and you basically make it into uh, uh, three. You you, t you take the rope and you you make it into thirds. So you have to fold it so you have basically three. Uh, you, you, you took this length of rope and you made it into basically a third of its length. So on one end, you're going to wrap it around and through in the same direction that you're going. And then on the other end, you wrap it around and through again in the same direction that it's going. And by pulling on both ends of the rope, this one looks like an overhand knot, I need to fix that. It's not an overhand knot, it's just, it's a wrap and then it's going in the direction that you're going. So it's not a complete overhand knot, but it's designed to be a tension knot. So if you're pulling on both ends of the rope, it will hold. However, it's also easy to undo if you take the pressure off the rope. Um, then you can, you can pull the ends of the sheep shank out by just pushing those loops back through the holes and it comes back out. So it's a way of shortening rope temporarily but also lengthening it back again when you need it. All right, so that was my demonstration of requirements six and seven.
knowing the uses of rope and some important knots, as well as um, knowing how to whip the end of a rope. And that concludes my demonstration of requirements for the Tenderfoot Award for BPSA and my application for the Squire Award. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.